Well, in every country there are objections to science, and this year is the year of Darwin, 2009, so we're going to have more of these objections. But nevertheless, by and large, there is no doubt that education is growing and there is a need for science education to grow equally in the developing countries as it is in the rich countries. This picture, again, tells it all. It is the opposite of the picture with the blackboard and the ruler. It is children discovering for themselves, learning, children following a teacher. I think these, uh, these pictures are very telling. They're children following a teacher who's giving a lecture. And these are younger people who are following distance learning. So structured learning is one way. Instruction is one, structured learning is another. And with the increasing availability of these cheaper computers, self-learning will also become important. I'm not sure we're quite ready to go that fast yet, but yes, my friends, we want to go as fast as possible and start as early as possible. That, I think, should be part of the rule. So the super course will allow the teachers to organize their own material. As Ron said, it's for free. Nobody tells you what to do. You can take whatever you want. You can take a whole lecture or individual slides, tailor the lecture to his or her needs, and stay in touch in an easy and accessible fashion with the latest in the area of science, with a community of scholars, a community of practice in the field that you're in, through this marvelous invention, the Internet, which puts at our fingertips the entire global knowledge availability. In the Library of Alexandria, we've recognized this from the beginning. And everywhere we have computers as well as reading tables. So we're really talking about the global partnership anchored here, hopefully, in the Library of Alexandria to provide that. This is, these are the statistics that Ron went through. That is the DVD, which I hope uh, Dr. Faham, everybody will get uh, one. And please share it with others as much as you want. And to make the super course work, we need to build these communities of practice. It has been done. Ron and his colleagues did it in epidemiology. Can we not do it in agriculture, in engineering, and in, in uh, uh, environment as well? I think we can, starting with these four. Then let's see where we go. We want to organize them, not only collect the best lectures, but organize them in a user-friendly way, make them available for free, constantly update the information, and that requires the scientific communities of practice. Now, the availability of the lectures and, the, and, the, and the, the rating of the lectures will come as a byproduct of the regular work of practicing lecturing scientists, because that's what they will be doing. So why the Library of Alexandria? Well, I'd like to say that it's nice to be here at the very spot of the old Library of Alexandria, dedicated to science, but this time born digital thanks to the effort of Dr. Magdi Nagy and Dr. Noha Adli, who I think deserve a hand. <laughs> they and their team have really built a first-class digital institution here. So there is a symbolic value, but there's also a more practical reason to choose the PA. For one thing, here in Egypt, and Egypt has an influence in this part of the world, the PA is becoming a notable institution. We receive over a million visitors a year, and this is actually a science program. This picture was with Huda and Mikati on the eclipse, but uh, we do a lot of that. So it shows you that there's a lot of hunger for people to learn about science. Uh, we have over 600 events. That's another science lecture that's being shown here. This was uh, done uh, with Dr. Faham. And this is an international gatherings, many other things, many scientific conferences. About 800,000 visitors annually just come to visit for the day. And of these are thousands of children. And we have about 350,000 reader visits every year. Our websites receive over 200 million hits, probably more by now. And hopefully with the super course, it will add a lot more. We have a complex of lively institutions. And through this connectivity, we can say that the digital future is here and that we are proud to work with those who will be the artisans of a better future. So can we really transform the teaching of science in the developing world? I say yes. And I say dare to dream and dare to be bold. And I'll give you two examples of why you should dare to dream and dare to be bold. 
We can do things differently. We don't have to rely on the old-fashioned ways of sending books to remote areas and then wondering about whether you can send the next volume or not. We can succeed in doing this. And the two examples I want to give you is the first one, Antarctica. Now, Antarctica is, of course, the continent at the bottom, which is very, very cold, as you know. It's a very big place. And when it was discovered in the recent sense of being discovered, people wanted to bring in the bulldozers and uh, look for oil, or look for factories, minerals, etc. Lots of money was going to be made. Some people talked about military bases there. And at the time, my late friend Jacques-Yves Cousteau and other friends said, no. And I said, what do you mean no? I said, this is a pristine area. Let us keep it only for wildlife and for science. And somebody said to him, do you seriously believe you want to keep a whole continent just for a bunch of penguins? And he said, yes. And guess what? They did. They succeeded. The Antarctica Agreement was signed, and Antarctica remained pristine as much as any part of this planet could remain pristine to this day. Second example. 1963, a great man, Martin Luther King, stood on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C., and gave a moving lecture, in which the theme was, I have a dream, and in which he said, I have a dream that my children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Well, dreams can be realized. 45 years to the day, Barack Obama stood before 76,000 people accepting the Democratic nomination to be President of the United States and went on to win with over 360 electoral votes to be the first president of the United States elected with no attention to the color of his skin. He taught us from his autobiography the importance of the audacity of hope and to think that we can do things different and we can change. And a great lady, Margaret Mead, said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. It is indeed the only thing that ever has. And so, who are this small group of thoughtful, committed citizens? All of you here. All of you who are here today are the nucleus of the group that will transform the BA Science Superforce from a dream into reality. That will take the application that Ron Laporte and his colleagues forged for epidemiology and health into the bigger domain of science. Uh, believe me, if we work all together, there's so much we can do for a whole generation and for the whole world. And we, with your help, right here in the Library of Alexandria, will provide a base for that. And we have a small team. It may look very small compared to the competition, which may be very large, but you know what? We're going to surprise you. <laughs> <laughs>